Right, so today is Workers' Day, the 1st of May, and uh, today's video is uh, a lecture that was recorded last night at the Rondebosch United Church in Cape Town uh, on the occasion of the 8th Steve de Grucci Memorial Lecture. Uh, Professor Steve de Grucci was a South African theologian who uh, died in a, a tragic accident uh, in the prime of his life and his career. And uh, the lecture last night was delivered by his father, Professor John de Grouchy, uh, one of uh, South Africa's best known uh, theologians, a real uh, gift to African theology, an NRF, National Research Foundation, A-rated uh, scientist, so the highest uh, ranking that one can get. Uh, he holds two PhDs, uh, one in theology and one in social science and uh, was a full professor at the University of Cape Town and is now an extraordinary professor at the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, John tackled a very difficult and topical uh, issue which uh, solicited uh, a lot of feedback online uh, when we posted about it. The title of his lecture is Can a White Male Christian Enter the Kingdom of Heaven? So it's a very interesting lecture and uh, yeah, I hope you find it stimulating. It obviously touches on issues of race, uh, issues related to gender, uh, issues related to Christianity and uh, other faiths, and of course issues related uh, to justice transformation, renewal and reconciliation. Uh, John very kindly sent me a text copy of the lecture, which I will also attach in the show notes. So uh, up next, uh, Professor John de Grucci delivering the eighth Steve de Grucci Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Zanili, for your kind words. It's wonderful to be here this evening. And thank you to everyone who has come out on this evening. It's rainy evening, which of course is a sign of blessing in Africa to have rain. And uh, I uh, hope that we will be uh, blessed as we continue. So is it possible? Judging from the comments I received, since the topic of my lecture was announced, it seems to have touched the sensitive nerve. Some people said they would only attend if I answered the question in the affirmative. And others said the answer, of course, had to be no. One person wrote, if you think that is a difficult question, how about answering, can a white male homophobic Dutch Reformed Afrikaner Dumini enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> Yet another said, what a stupid question. Yet judging from the number of white male South Africans present here this evening, it seems as if there is some interest in finding out. <laughs> How can we be saved from the wrath to come? And I confess, at this stage of life, I have some personal interest in the matter. <laughs> the question is certainly a personal one, and obviously, as Anelia said, a theological one. But it is also, as she also pointed out, a social and political question. Because it is thinking about the future place and role of white males in South Africa, not least as we face the general election next week, but more importantly, as we face the future as a whole. But why single out white males as though we are a distinct tribe and have perhaps a favoured place in society and some kind of unique role to fulfil? Why give us a special status and further inflate our already inflated egos? Or some might say, why pick on us? exposing our faults and failures, accusing us of being part of the problem and making us feel more guilty. We are not the only ones to blame for what is wrong. Just leave us alone and let us mingle with everyone else and hopefully not be noticed so that our white maleness is not seen or heard. Of course, we should not generalize. Not all white South African males are the same. 
some are English speaking, others are Afrikaans. Some are poorer than others, and some are filthy rich. Some are Christian, others Jewish, and yet others secular. Some come from good schools, others not. Some are gay, others not. Some come from loving and caring families, others from dysfunctional families. And as is true of all people, whether white males or not, some are born with more gifts and talents than others. Some have had greater opportunity than others. Some are shy, some are outgoing. Some have inherited long life genes and others not. All types and conditions apply to white male South Africans as they do to any other group of people. But of course, if you are white, male and gay, you are certainly not part of the white, male, macho trust. In years past, you had to stay within the closet, whether at school or college, whether in business and the workplace, whether on the sports field or in the club, in the army or the church. Gay, white males may have been privileged as white males under apartheid, but if they did not play by the homophobic rules of the time, they were ridiculed and excluded. In fact, that highlights the fact that playing by the rules, being part of the old boys network, made it very difficult for any white male who were inclined to be non-conformist, whether gay or not. Yes, there are many variables within our tribe, except for one fact. We are all white, all male, and we happen to live in South Africa. So let me say four things about my topic at the beginning. First, while my focus is on white male South Africans, my question is also inclusive. How can it not be? For how can anyone, irrespective of race, gender and nationality, enter the kingdom of heaven? If you are not a white male, you can and should feel included this evening by asking yourself the question, how can I enter the kingdom of heaven? Secondly, my question is specifically about white males because they are largely responsible, or we are largely responsible, for creating and sustaining colonialism and apartheid. And we have done so because we have had a privileged place in society and, moreover, the power to do so. Thirdly, it is also specifically about white males because many regard them as a liability, if not an embarrassment, in public, business and academic life, rather than an asset. And fourthly, a reminder that there have been and still are remarkable white male South Africans who have risen above their race, gender and class, and played as they continue to do an important role in working for a more just South Africa. I could add a fifth preliminary comment, because this lecture is in honour of the memory of Stephen de Grisham, and he was, as we all know, a white male South African. So I think the topic is appropriate, and I feel that he would have approved my choice. Undoubtedly, he would also think that he could deliver a better lecture on the subject. <laughs> but sadly, he can't any longer. But did Steve enter the kingdom of heaven? If he did, then it must be possible for any white South African male to do so. And we could all go and have the promised glass of wine and go home early. But then there might be an uproar of disapproval in this assembly. Some shouting, no, he didn't. And others, how can we know for sure? And yet others, what do you mean by entering the kingdom of heaven anyway? I might even be accused of avoiding the question by answering it so quickly. 
and getting you here under false pretenses, pretensions of a cold and rainy night. So, I must continue. But it is a very difficult lecture to give. How I wish Steve was still alive to give it instead, and I'm sure do it better. We still miss him very much. But I must put emotion aside and accept the task of gratitude. Well, how many fathers are asked to give a lecture in honoured remembrance of their son? How many fathers have had a son who was such an exceptional and talented man, whose memory has been celebrated in this way for the past eight years by a series of distinguished lecturers and to all the people? <laughs> so despite the emotional challenge, I accept the task because I think Steve would want me to do it. And I think he would have approved the topic. And if he had delivered it, he would have done so with that characteristic, characteristic impish grin on his face that always told us his parents that he was up to some mischief. And as he was also a preacher, I begin with a passage from the Bible. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were all greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. I actually mistyped that and said, Are oh, impossible. <laughs> An impossible possibility. The interaction between Jesus and his disciples occurred after a rich young man came to Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him to keep the commandment. The man replied that he had done so since his youth. Jesus looked at him and, as the Gospel tells us, loved him. But there was still one thing he had to do. He had to sell his possessions and give the money to the poor. Downcast, he turned away. That was simply a bridge too far. The cost of entering the kingdom of heaven was far too great. This story, as you may know, played a decisive role in the conversion of St. Francis of Assisi. For he too was a privileged son of a rich businessman. But there came the day when he did what the young man in Jesus' story did not do. He gave up his inheritance and followed Jesus like a poor beggar. We admire St. Francis, but few of us follow his example in renouncing privilege to follow Christ and so enter the kingdom of heaven. A comparable story is told of Henry Nguyen, the well-known writer of books on spirituality, who left his comfortable position of the university chaplain in Boston to live in solidarity among the poor in Latin America. But once there, he discovered that it was impossible to identify with them fully. He was always going off to have a bath somewhere or to go to a movie. Unlike him, he also knew he could escape the daily grind of poverty and that he always had a way out. The poor did not. Eventually he returned to live in Boston. We don't think less of Noah for opting out. At least he tried, which is more than most of us managed to do. In fact, most of us who are privileged have diluted Jesus' teaching to such an extent that Christianity has become, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's Dietrich Bonhoeffer by the way, is the name? Bonhoeffer. <laughs> uh, said it's cheap grace. 
The Christian life has been reduced to being happy, fulfilled, and achieving success. Now, I don't decry these values, for I like to be happy, fulfilled, and to be successful is also what one might say to be blessed. But they're not specifically Christian values. The truth is, Jesus' teaching goes against the grain of privileged life, whether ancient or modern or medieval. Even if we resist turning Christianity into a prosperity cult, we still find it very difficult, if not impossible, to follow Jesus' path of costly discipleship. His teaching on forgiveness, reconciliation, love for one's enemies, and solidarity in the struggles and suffering of the poor is very difficult, if not, as some say, impractical in the real world. Steve wrote his doctoral dissertation on the work of the American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. And from Niebuhr he learned that the teaching of Jesus is an impossible possibility. No one can follow Jesus' teaching fully, Niebuhr says. It is an impossibility because the ethical demands made by Jesus are incapable of fulfilment in our world. And yet, he went on to say, by the grace of God, the impossible can become possible, and sometimes does. The teaching of Jesus may be an impossible possibility, but he would not have invited us to enter the kingdom of heaven if it was not possible for us to do so. How many of us, however, who call ourselves Christians actually try to follow Jesus? How many of us are therefore serious about entering the kingdom of heaven, whether we are white, male South Africans or not? So what about the kingdom of heaven? My question is not only gender and racially specific or socially and political significant, it is also theological because it has to do with entering the kingdom of heaven. It is not about whether white male South Africans can obtain a visa to visit the United States if they really are desperate, or the United Kingdom. It is not about whether they can become Australians and live in Perth, or whether they can immigrate to Canada. It is not about whether they can attend the University of Cape Town or the University of Limpopo. It is not about who they can marry, whether they can own property, or whether they should see, receive the same salary as anybody else. It is not about whether they are better than others in sports or academics. It is specifically about whether they can enter the kingdom of heaven. So what then is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven, as understood in the New Testament, does not refer to a place we happen to call heaven to which some of us, if not all of us, go when we die, whether we happen to be white or black, male or female. The word heaven is a synonym for the word God. Orthodox, Orthodox Jews were forbidden from uttering the word God, because that would be taking God's name in vain and breaking the first command, simply to utter the Hebrew word for God was blasphemy. So instead of referring to the kingdom of God, they spoke about the kingdom of heaven. Heaven was a substitute word for God, the unpronounceable. If you read the Gospels, you will see that when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or heaven, and he talks about both according to which gospel you're reading, he is talking about how we are to live here and now. When he says his kingdom is not of this world, he is not saying that it has nothing to do with the world, he is saying that it is not subject to the authority of this world. It's not of this world, its authority comes from somewhere else. So let me introduce here a helpful insight which I have learned from Bonifer.
<laughs> it is a distinction he makes between the ultimate and the penalty. The ultimate, he says, is being justified by God or being saved, as some might say, with life in death, life after death in mind. Now this is beyond the control of any of us because it is all a matter of God's grace. According to the Gospel, nobody, whether white or black, male or female, South African, German, Brit, Brazilian or Burundian, can be saved by the good works. The good news of Jesus Christ is that salvation is a gift of grace. That is the ultimate which God alone makes possible. But we do have a say when it comes to the penultimate, the things before the last things, by doing what God asks of us here and now. And there is a connection between them. So if eternal salvation is your concern this evening as a white male, rest assured that that is not in your hands. And fortunately, God's grace is sufficient even when it comes to us, the chief of sinners. God's amazing grace is ultimate. The penultimate, by contrast, is about life lived here and now. It is about the way in which we fulfill our responsibility in this world. It is about entering the narrow gate into the kingdom of God today in this life, not just the next. It is about doing the will of God today. It is about the reign of God over the world and therefore about us living responsibility, responsibly before God as the one in charge. Now that is clear from the story of the rich young man who came to Jesus. He wanted to know how he could live his life in accordance with God's will. Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. That he has done, the man replies, well and good, says Jesus. But you might have kept him literally by not stealing, committing adultery, or coveting your neighbor's ass, or in his BMW Series 6. <laughs> but you have failed to keep the intention of God's commandments. Because they are not just about what you should not do, they are more importantly about what you must do. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love even your enemy. Seek God's justice before else. Go the extra mile. Forgive seventy times seven. Sell your possessions and give to the poor and take up the cross. So my question, can a white South African male enter the kingdom of heaven or of God? is not about whether we white South African males can be saved and go to heaven when we die, but whether we can do God's will while we live. <coughs> Are we, in other words, able to seek first God's kingdom and his justice before everything else? Can us prodigal sons get out of the pigsty of male privilege and white privilege and find a way to join the human family back home? Can we who have squandered our inheritance become brothers with the rest of humanity rather than think we are a family tribe entitled to inherit the earth? Can a white South African male be liberated from the privilege and power in order to participate with everyone else as an equal in making South Africa a country that reflects God's kingdom of justice, reconciliation and peace? Or should we just throw in the towel, go on a white male binge, or try, try to save our souls by emigrating to the kingdom of heaven known as Trump land, or Brexit Britain, or Wonderland Dubai? So my question is this, are white South African males too trapped in their privileged past, too much part of the problem to be of any use going into the future? 
Would history eventually cast us aside as relics with no role in the present and no place in the future? Would it not be prudent to wash our hands of the problem and walk away with the rich young group? Do we have a meaningful role to play with everyone else in making this country more just, compassionate, peaceful and beautiful? It may seem an impossibility to some, but could it perhaps be possible? Can a leopard change its spots? Probably not. But a fat cat, juicy caterpillar can become a beautiful butterfly, unless squashed underfoot. Such a transformation is possible, but it requires rebirth, and a necessary prelude to rebirth is the need to acknowledge our status, where we are at this point, our privileged status. For without doing that, we will not see the need to change or have the courage and the will to do so. Being a white South African male meant that Steve, like most of the rest of us, was privileged. The only downside of being a white male under apartheid was that if you, was that if you were, you were liable to be conscripted into the army. And of course, if you're at school, you were forced to play rugby against your will very often. As a result, many paid the ultimate price with their lives. Many others were physically disabled. And many, many others were psychologically damaged, brutalized by their experiences on the border and in the townships. They too are white South African males living today among us. The psychological and social consequences of that senseless war are still very much part of the problem we face today, very much part of the background to violence against women and others. Not least among those white males who were part of the military machine and the security apparatus. You only have to read the records of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to know their stories. And I have had recent personal experience in counselling at least one of them. Nonetheless, being white and male was still a privileged state. We could go to a good school and a good university if we chose and had the entrance qualifications. We had good sporting facilities, and when we turned 18, we had the vote, and could more easily rise to positions of power and influence in the public arena, particularly if we belonged to the right party. And not least, job reservation meant that we could find employment fairly easily. Yes, apartheid was all about white male economic empowerment. That might no longer be the case, but we, the previously advantaged, haven't done too badly since 1994. In fact, in many ways, we are still privileged in a world where racism often continues to reign and violence against women is rampant. Of course, being white, black, or brown is a matter of skin and color. Apartheid was built on the color of our skin and how a person looked, not on intelligence, education, profession, wealth, sporting ability, artistic or musical talent. It was all a matter of skin color. Being white, black, or brown is what mattered and that determined your fate. The party made it impossible to be colored blind because it was built on color, and even today, that is still very difficult to achieve, even though we say we live in a non-racial society. Racism is deeply ingrained. But while race is real, it is not scientific. The notion of race as distinct from ethnicity or culture 
was an ancient European invention associated with darkest Africa, the mysterious other beyond the Atlas Mountains. Scientifically, the pigment of our skins has to do with whether our ancestors had too much or too little sun. It is a matter of evolutionary adaptation. A Desmond Tutu, who incidentally was meant to be here this evening and said he and his wife were coming, but I think the weather kept them away, once said, white people are rather colorless. <laughs> the truth is, our ancestors had too little sunshine, which may also be why we cannot all sing and dance as well as our compatriots who benefited from a surfeit of sun or vitamin D. Why is there a page missing here, is it me? I'll find it. There we go. But while race may not be scientific, it is a social and political reality. It has very serious consequences. It may be a myth created by Europeans over the centuries to justify conquest, slavery, and colonialism, but saying so does not get rid of the effects of such conquest and slavery. I came across a quote of the great theologian Karl Barth the other day that I'd never come across before in his writings. I want to read part of it and listen carefully. He's a Swiss theologian. You can't get more white than that. When members of the white race, he wrote, all enjoy every possible intellectual and material advantage on the basis of the superiority of one race and the subjection of many other races, and of the use of that for centuries our race has made of both. My share in the sin against Africa or Asia for the last hundred or fifty years may be very remote or indirect, but would Europe be what it is, and would I be what I am, if that colonial expansion and slavery had never happened? I did not take it from anybody, but I did inherit it all. Yes, racism is a powerful myth, concocted to justify the way things are. Just like the caste system in India or the class system in the United Kingdom, it has little to do with ability, but everything to do with birth, inheritance, the way you look and the way you speak. If it had to do with ability, the class system in England, Brexit would never be on the table. There are those who are born to be servants, and those who are born to rule. That is the ugly lie that has fed colonialism and racism. And just as racism is a powerful myth, so is patriarchy. The notion that males should dominate females is a matter of course. And this obviously does not only apply to white, white males, but all males, and not least in our society, which is riddled with violence against women as much in the townships as in the suburbs. It has taken a long while for males to recognize the injustice of this patriarchal myth, even in sophisticated European countries. Even in Switzerland, from where Karl Barth came, where after the Second World War, women still did not have the vote. Just like racism, patriarchy is a social construction of reality. And for males to change that reality, it has to be deconstructed. And males have to be engaged in doing so, as they have to be engaged in combating racism if they are going to stand a chance of entering the kingdom of heaven. But can we break the genetic code that makes us white males? Well, conversions have been known to happen. And the conversion of St. Paul on the Damascus Road remains a paradigmatic example that we most quote. However, remember this. The narrative of Paul's conversion was not about how he got to heaven in an afterlife, but how he received new sight and became a changed man. 
The story is all about a privileged Pharisee and persecutor of despised outcasts, becoming a servant of them at great cost to himself. How could a bigoted racist and religionist, as well as a male chauvinist, become someone who proclaimed an inclusive gospel, even if he didn't understand fully the consequences, but which he said embraced everyone, whether they are slaves or free, whether they are Jews or Gentiles, whether they are male or female. How could such a change happen? How could the persecutor and misogynist enter the kingdom of God? He could because God took him by the scruff of the neck and, not least, with the help of a few friends, was given a new set of eyes with which to see reality and a new set of ears with which to hear things differently. But more than that, he not only heard and saw differently, when he did so, he had the courage to act differently. To break the rules that were unjust, unfair, and kept others in bondage. And in doing so, Paul discovered that he was set free from the bondages of his own past. So can a white male change his genetic, genetic code and enter the kingdom of heaven? Or is it something determined by ancestry and genes? Now many of Steve's ancestors, I must tell you, were Vikings. We have that document. Others were knights in the Crusades. And one of them was a general in Napoleon's army. His great-grandparents were British settlers and colonists. So how come that Steve, the descendant of warlike Vikings, became a pacifist? a conscientious objector, and an advocate of gender equality. And how come that he, the descendants of colonists, was a proponent of post-colonialism even before it became fashionable, fashionable to be so? How did this white South African male buck the trend that his genes dictated and made a valiant attempt to enter the kingdom of God? Well, let me try and tell you. From the day that Steve was born, he had his own mind. He may have been baptised Stephen, but he chose, as soon as he could talk, to be called Steve. He did not play rugby and cricket at school, but he did play soccer with his friends, black and white, on pitches around the town, and the guitar in the folk club in the evening. He befriend, befriended strangers, he had black friends and gay friends. He became a conscientious objector, refusing to be part of the system. But he was not alone, and this is the point I want to make. Like other courageous young white South African males who undermined the dominant white male paradigm, he broke with them the stereotype of their tribe and class. Together they began to see things from below, again, as Bonifatola, from the perspective of the less privileged and the oppressed. They decided, as a group, not to follow the crowd of white male South Africans, but rather to try and seek first God's kingdom. It was difficult, very difficult at times, and sometimes it ended up in prison. But it wasn't impossible. And the temptation to walk away was always present, but somehow they hung in. Steve Biko not only taught us that blacks had to liberate themselves, he also said that they had to help whites liberate themselves, and that when whites are liberated, they become black. Now anybody from outside of South Africa trying to understand the race problem will never understand that, that when whites are liberated, they become black. But that's what Steve Biko said, and he was right by which he meant that there were whites who somehow had broken free or been liberated from their whiteness by joining in the struggle against the party. Among them, Germany Bears would be an advocate for Ron Fisher and the brave white women of the Black South. They consciously broke free from the captivity of whiteness, as far as it was possible. So the question then, is not, can a white male South African enter the Kingdom of God, but how can we do so? 
And if the first step towards white male liberation requires acknowledging guilt for our sins of privilege, rather than feeling sorry for ourselves or making excuses or denying reality or looking for ways to escape. The second is getting rid of the idea that we cannot change, that we are who we are by birth and there's nothing more to be said. But that this is a fallacy is obvious because some have broken free, refused to conform to the patterns imposed by the dominant and prevailing norms and the skewed values of society. Looking back over the years to the time when Steve was growing up, Isabel and I can clearly see how it was that Steve became who he was and others like him. I do not mean how he became perfect because Steve was anything but perfect. He was certainly not a pious Christian. Steve was anything but a religious person, as that word is understood. But at an early age, he decided to follow Christ. I don't think he had a foggiest clue exactly what he was letting himself in for, but then few of us do. And in doing so, he managed to break with the norms that govern white apartheid society, the more he began to understand what his decision meant. As well as the norms that govern male patriarchal society, he also managed to break with the norms of a very homophobic and patriarchal society. And again, this is the point, he did not do so alone, in isolation from others. He had friends and mentors, he belonged to communities and groups that enabled, encouraged, empowered him. Who he became did not just happen overnight or in an instant. It was the outcome of a long process of formation. The caterpillar wasn't crushed underfoot, the caterpillar was enabled to become a butterfly. Whatever influences there may have been in the family, one major factor was that Steve, as a member of this congregation here in Wonderful, was exposed to an understanding of Christian faith that explicitly rejected apartheid and affirmed non-racialism. Steve's journey towards the Kingdom of Heaven could not have had a better start in terms of this congregation. Enabled through the ministry of Doug Bax, who is here with us this evening, and the youth ministry of Jim Cochran, who is also here. It is tragic that during the apartheid years, far too many white churches and congregations reinforced racism rather than challenged it. Steve was lucky, or shall we say was blessed, to be part of a Christian community that did the very opposite, and without which he would never have become who he was, or enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes, of course, us Christians will say that transformation is the work of the Spirit, but the Spirit works through human agency, and above all through communities of committed people who from one generation to the next pass on the values, hopes, and skills that help people to see things differently, break with the dominant norms of unjust, racist, and patriarchal societies, and enter God's kingdom of justice. No one changes unless parents, mothers, mentors, colleagues, companions, and congregations help that happen. Also important in Steve's journey towards the kingdom was his exposure to the teaching of the Bible in a way that not only made sense to him, but also offered an alternative understanding of what the Bible is about, and who he was, and what it means to be a Christian living fully in the world. You are not going to break with white male privilege if you read the Bible in ways that reinforce that understanding, and week by week you hear sermons that do the same. So you also need good teachers who help you understand what it means to be a Christian and a human being. You also need Christian mentors and icons who embody that different way of being Christian in the world. Icons such as Steve was influenced by Martin Luther King, who he studied, Bonifer, who he got from somebody or other, mm. Bayers Nordin, Desmond Tutu, and Joe Wing, an unsung hero in Steve's pilgrimage. All of them were models that played a role 
in shaping Steve's changing consciousness. So does that his exposure to the Mennonite Christians in America, who taught him about peace making, and his involvement in the Student Union for Christian Action that Edwin mentioned this evening, and in the wider life of our denomination that was always the majority of that church. Then there was his experience of young black Christians who both befriended and challenged him, as did those who were his companions on the journey of hope initiated by Archbishop Tutu, which took Steve to Teze community in France, where he had his call to the ministry. I mentioned that because that was so important in his journey, and also because there will be the great Teze youth meeting here in Cape Town in September, and you will receive, if you haven't, a pamphlet about that, which I hope you will read and give your support for. But it is often, if not only, when we hear the truth from the victims of oppression, only when we hear their stories and begin to participate with them in their struggles, that we actually begin to change. White South Africans cannot change in isolation from black Christians, black South Africans. You cannot become a champion of justice if you are not even able to see injustice through the eyes of those who experience it. You cannot become a worker for liberation if you do not experience something of the pain of oppression. You cannot hear the gospel in a life-changing way if you only hear it from white preachers. And of undoubted importance for Steve were the youth training programs that he participated in. Programs that exposed young white male South Africans to their black compatriots on an equal footing. Including the forward youth leadership training program to which we are inviting you to contribute this evening if you wish to do so. It's the fourth year of the program starting this coming month. Black and white young people training together to enter the kingdom of heaven. So I close. I dedicate this lecture, I didn't do it at the beginning, I do it at the end, to David de Grusha. David is Steve's son and our grandson. And David is represented, representative of a new generation of hopeful white South African males. He's living at the moment in a hut in the deep trans sky, learning to speak his Kosa and teaching in a high school. Such young South African males, white ones, love our country and are already making a contribution to the shaping of a better, more just, compassionate and sustainable South Africa. There are lots of them, young white male South Africans, willing to engage in shaping a better future and willing to share what they have received for the benefit of us all. This for me is a great sign of hope. For it is so easy for a white male to give up, to resign to fate, to fear for the future and to lose hope, to be crushed underfoot. Especially if you feel you are like the white rhino, part of an endangered species. But we can all make a difference and in the process become better human beings. For in the end it does not matter whether we are white or black, male or female, South African or from elsewhere. What matters is whether we are human beings. What matters is our God-given capacity and gifts to use for the common good of our planet and in the process become better human beings. For no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they become a better human being. To those who have been given much, Jesus said, much will be required. That is the punchline. Most of us, if not all of us here this evening, have been given much. If we hope for a better future, a better South Africa, we have to turn our assets of privilege into authentic acts of hopefulness <coughs> that make a difference, not just in the lives of others, but also set us free to be more truly and fully who we are meant to be. Can a white male South African enter the Kingdom of Heaven? 
With God, all things are possible. Yes, we can, by the grace of God. But we need a lot of help from our companions on the journey. So thanks for watching this lecture. I hope you found it uh, challenging, insightful, meaningful. Uh, I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. And uh, by all means, do so. Leave them uh, either in the show notes on YouTube or as a comment on Facebook if you found the video there. Or you can uh, send me a tweet at Digital Dion on Twitter or on Instagram at Digital Dion. And uh, yeah, just to say my, my regular Facebook account is full, I'm afraid. Uh, all all 5,000 little spots are taken, so uh, my public page uh, is available. So please uh, do like that, Dion A. Foster on uh, Facebook. So thanks for watching. Uh, please feel free to share this video. John is happy that we do so. And uh, yeah, you don't necessarily need to agree. In fact, the engagement is what makes the theological process uh, so meaningful and worthwhile. So uh, thanks for watching. And uh, check out my channel for other lectures, interviews and thoughts uh, mainly related to theology. So thanks for watching.